Welcome to the Dirt on Growing, where we don't just plant seeds, we plant ideas that challenge the norm. I'm your host, Brandon Rust from Full Crop Sciences, and this is the podcast where living soil meets real science. From worm castings to bottled nutrients, microbial inoculants, and chemical pesticides, we're here to question the trends, break down the data, and empower your grow. It's time to think deeper and grow better. What if I told you the famous 60-60 dry method is actually costing you terpenes, potency, and possibly even your lab tests? 60% Fahrenheit, 60% humidity, 10 to 14 days. You've seen it in forums. You hear it in grow rooms. People talk about it like it's gospel. But here's the truth. 60-60 isn't a gold standard. It's a compromise that ignores the actual physics and microbiology of what's happening in your flower during the curing process. Today, we're going to break it all down. By the end of this episode, you'll understand why 6060 keeps your buds in the microbial danger zone far too long, how to set up a faster control dry, the role of water activity, thermodynamics, and vapor pressure deficit in your drying process, and a step-by-step process from pre-harvest all the way to jars. Let's get into it. Let's start with the myth. 60-60 method says to dry your cannabis at 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 60% relative humidity for about two weeks. The idea is low and slow preserves terpenes and gives a smoother smoke. Now on the surface that sounds nice, but the problem is it doesn't account for water activity inside of the flower. It assumes every cultivar, every bud structure, and every grow needs the same environment. And it keeps your flower in the perfect range for mold and yeast for far too long. When you chop down a plant, the water locked inside those flower is way above what microbes need to grow. Microbes don't care what your room is set to, they care how much available water is inside the plant material. At 60% Fahrenheit and 60% RH, the air feels cozy and cool, but inside a dense cola, the water activity is high for several days. So while you feel good about your slow dry process, you're actually giving microbes an opportunity to procreate in your flower. Most growers talk about moisture in terms of how it feels or maybe relative humidity in the room, but the real metric that predicts mold is water activity. Water activity is basically how much available water is inside the product for microbes to use. It's measured on a scale from zero to one, pure water being one and bone dry material closer to zero. For cannabis, we want water activity levels to be between 0.55 and 0.62. Most molds and yeast need around 0.7 and above to grow. So our entire goal when drying is to move the flower down through that danger zone quickly, then stabilize it between 0.55 and 0.62 for storage. We're not taking a guess or gauging by how it feels. We're looking at real measurable targets. Now, what actually makes water leave the plant? We're dealing with the laws of thermodynamics and you need to remember this phrase. Everything flows down a gradient. Water moves from where there's more energy and more available water to where there's less. When your flower is freshly harvested, the inside is almost like a water balloon. High water activity and high internal vapor pressure. When the air around your flower is drier and slightly warmer, there's a strong gradient. Water wants to leave the plant, evaporate into the air, and equalize that difference. That gradient between the plant and the air is what dries your weed. If the air is too humid, that gradient is weak and water leaves slowly. If the air is too dry and too hot, that gradient is too aggressive and you fry the outside while the core is still wet. So you're looking for a controlled, intentional gradient. VPD or vapor pressure deficit is one of the ways to measure that gradient. Higher VPD will exert a stronger drying force, while lower VPD will result in slower drying time. And that is why it's slow. But it also means the internal parts of that flower stay in that high water activity, high risk range for days or weeks. Our approach uses 70 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 40 to 45% relative humidity, which gives you a higher VPD and a stronger gradient. That lets us move through the danger zone faster without cooking the flour. So that's the science, water activity, thermodynamic gradients, and vapor pressure deficit. Now let's talk about how to actually run this in your grow. The drying process does not start when you cut down the plant. Step one actually starts at pre-harvest with a dry back. A few days before harvest, in the last several days, you should run a controlled dry back on the root zone. 
This means no heavy saturating irrigations right before chop. Let the pots or beds get lighter, let the soil or media dry out, and you should see a reduction in leaf tuger without letting them wilt. The idea is to remove excess water from the plant while it's still alive. You're lowering the total water load and the internal water activity before the plant ever hits the dry room. Step two is defoliation. When it's time to harvest, strip off all of the big fan leaves because basically they're just giant water pads. And whenever possible, hang whole plants or at least large branches. Fan leaves hold a ton of extra water but don't add to the quality of the final product. By removing them, you reduce how much water has to be removed post harvest. Hanging whole plants or larger branches gives you some structural buffer. They slow the outside dry just enough that you don't desiccate the outer layer while the middle layer is still moist. Step three is to set up your dry room. You wanna dry between 70 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 40 to 45% RH for approximately seven to eight days. Some varieties, depending on the density of the flower and the size of the plant, may take an additional few days. You want gentle, indirect airflow. Do not place fans directly blowing on drying plants and keep everything in the dark without direct sunlight. With these settings, VPD is higher, water activity inside the buds drops faster, and you move more quickly through that 0.7 plus range where mold and yeasts grow. And because the temperature is still reasonable and airflow is gentle, you're not degrading terpenes. You typically run this for around seven to eight days, but the calendar is just a guide. The real indicators are stem snap and the outside of the bud should feel dry while the core still has a little give. Step four is the toting phase. And the goal is to homogenize moisture. Once the stems of the flower snap off the stalk, buck all of the untrimmed flower into totes, about 75% full and place a lid that is not airtight for about two to three days. Make sure that once or twice daily, you mix up the flour to help homogenize and distribute that moisture evenly. And at this point, the outer layer of the bud is much drier than the inner core, but over the course of those two to three days, water will migrate and diffuse from the wetter core to the drier outside tissue and moisture levels will homogenize across the flour. Step five is really important, it's trimming without rehydrating your flower. If your dry room is nice and controlled at 45 or 40 RH and it's cool and you bring that into an environment that has higher RH, the flower will reabsorb water. So the simple rule is don't trim in an environment that is more humid than your dry room. Ideally, you wanna trim in the same room or at least conditions similar to the space that you dry in. Step six is checking water activity level after trimming. You don't wanna put anything into jars until you've met the proper requirements for water activity levels between 0.55 and 0.62. Below 0.65, mold and yeast can't really grow, and above 0.55, the product isn't too dry that it smokes harsh and lifeless. If you don't have a meter, you can put a small sample of trimmed flour in a small sealed container, drop a high quality digital hydrometer, and let it sit for 12 to 24 hours. If that jar stabilizes around 55 to 60% relative humidity, you're pretty close to the right target activity range. The last stage is storage. Once you've hit that proper water activity level window, you jar up your flower without concern of microbial contamination. This last process also helps to redistribute, homogenize any remaining moisture and can help slow chemical changes, soften the smoke and redefine the aroma. You shouldn't be constantly burping jars because if you are, it means that you've jarred too wet. Remember to keep jars and bags in cool, dark environment to maintain the integrity of your product. What's going on, everybody? I hope you guys enjoyed that pre-recorded video explaining all of the proper steps for drying and curing. I also wanted to talk a little bit about oxidation. And one of the things is the longer that you stretch your dry time, the longer amount of time that that material is exposed to the environment, particularly oxygen. And what happens is cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, they all volatile. They, they'll volatize or they'll oxidize and start to degrade. So doing, doing it a little bit faster, getting it in, toted up, trimmed and jarred faster and getting that water activity low quicker 
not only does it preserve the integrity of the flower from a microbial standpoint, but also what you're doing is you're preserving terpenes and cannabinoids from both oxidation. And again, the longer the amount of time that they're exposed to oxygen, they'll volatize. So we're decreasing that. Remember, make sure you guys go to the website. We still have freebies of the Starfighter Cross to Miracle Alien Cookie F2s with purchases over $100. And if you guys have questions, now is the time. I'll open it up. I also dropped a link in the chat to submit questions. And with that questionnaire, I'll look at those. And I'm using that to create content for you guys so I can understand, you know, what type of content I should be making for you guys. I know everybody's at a different skill set and a different level and a different place in their cultivation journey. So I want to be able to provide beneficial information to a wide variety, you know, for a wide variety of topics. So we'll just go ahead and open it up. Yes, Mike is asking if there's any clones. Today is the last day to order clones. I'm going to Chicago for the weekend. I will not be back in the office until Wednesday. So... I have clones here at the office already. They're super limited. I think I have a couple skunk cuts left, and I think I have some Trainwreck Blueberry MK Ultra from 2003. Secta says, how many arguments have you been in when trying to explain this drying method to old heads? It's not so much old heads. I feel like most, most look, the majority of people, when you approach them in a respectful manner and provide them with the proper type of information that is both easy to understand and relatable. It makes an easier transition for someone to switch from what they were doing to what's a little bit better. I have people all the fucking time. I have people every single week tell me that they've switched over to this drying method and they're getting the best flavors, the best smoke, the, you know, and their flower is essentially, you know, holding up longer. Where should you land on the wood moisture meter? It's really hard, you know, it's if you can get a water activity level meter, that's that's fine. But also you can do things like you can just take a digital uh, hydrometer. And if you are uncertain about whether or not you should be uh, putting something into a jar after it's dried, again, remember biggest thing that step six is trimming without rehydrating the weed. So keeping the actual flower in an environment similar to where you're drying, because if you take it out of that environment with higher humidity, it'll rehydrate. So that's something that's really important. You have to take into consideration. But if you're uncertain or you don't have a meter, you can take some fresh flour. You can take a small container with a little small hydrometer. They make some that are about like this big. And if you put it in there and leave it in there for 12 to 24 hours and you read it, if it is above 60% moisture when it's sealed in that jar, you still need to let that flower dry out or you should have let it dry it out a little bit longer. Usually uh, 55 to 60 RH with a little hydrometer inside of a sealed jar is a way that if you don't have a water activity meter, you can kind of gauge. What's the best way to store and collect pollen? It's to completely dry out the pollen. Um, pollen's super, super fragile it doesn't weigh anything and it can disperse in the air really easily so um, you basically just when you're collecting pollen you want to put it on like a, a big tray so it's not all compiled on top of each other somewhere it can dry out obviously you can't have a fan on it or anything like that um, but just drying it out and then storing it in the fridge is probably best with a desiccant right because you don't want moisture from the cold environment to spoil that pollen Here's a comment it says grateful trimming in a room with different humidity than what you were drying in definitely screwed me over. It's one of the biggest things that I can tell growers like 
because you know you're in that dry room and this is actually why at our facility which still isn't open we're still waiting on the fucking paperwork but in our facility our drying space and our trimming space and our storage space is all in one room it's sectioned off but it all stays environmentally controlled so that way when we trim and when we store those those parameters all stay the same i've seen it before where a really good example is like so you have something drying everything's controlled right and let's say it's raining out or something high humidity and you're not really thinking about that but you go into the other room you go into the living room and you got all your material bucked up and you've got your tote off and you're sitting there trimming up and it's high humidity and you're not aware of it right what's happening is that that fresh flower is rehydrating um so something to be really careful about you know pro tip some of the pro tips is number six all right. Well, uh, I think that concludes this episode. I really appreciate you guys joining us for the live q and I will save this and you guys can rewatch it. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. It helps uh, with the algorithm. It helps get viewers and it helps me as a small business. Make sure you go and tap in at the Bokashi Earthworks website. And remember, I'm making content for you guys' questions. So go and uh, hit that link and submit your questions. Thank you.